My name is Gene DeLisa. I'll, I, I uh, write the program notes and I will be your tour guide for yet another concert. Um, those of you who were at the last concert, um, remember that I played excerpts of the pieces to try to even explain how things actually worked. Um, even with a nice CD player and a very good performance on CD, you found out that it really had nothing to compare with hearing Don Juan in person. I mean, sitting in this room hearing a live orchestra play something like that was really spectacular. Um, I, I drew a comparison between Brahms and uh, Strauss and uh, Don Juan. It was, it was a political thing. There were two different political camps, the absolute music people and the program music people. Well, in this concert, um, we have different composers and different pieces, but we're all categorizing them as impressionistic even though they, they approach their music in, in very different ways. It's like looking at either one of the political parties, and, and you know there's one that far to this side, far to that side, even within the same party. So even though they're imp impressionists, um, they approach things in different ways. I think the two French composers we all listen to today, uh, Debussy, and Mandel have been categorized together in the same way that Mahler and Bruckner have been, as if they left from the same compositional pod and they're joined at the hip, even though their approaches are really quite different. Um, in the little paragraph on Debussy, I was trying to draw some similarities between Ravel and Debussy. I listed some pieces with similar titles, I speak French with a southern New Jersey accent, so I won't even try to uh, pronounce those. But you can see there's, there's a similarity there. They both occasionally, well, some of the musical materials that they use is, is similar. For example, it's hard to find a Debussy piece that doesn't use an unusual scale, like a whole tone scale or a pentatonic scale. As a matter of fact, in La Mer, throughout, throughout, there is a mode that Debussy invented that I reproduced on the facing page um, within the La Mer. Now, I know everyone here doesn't read music, which is part of why I bother to bring my laptop and have the examples, the, the examples that I put for the musical examples. I will uh, play those guys. So, I've tried to list the things that were in common with Ravel and Debussy. Um, they, I guess the thing that I left out was they were both French and they probably liked to drink wine and eat cheese. But above and beyond that, their approaches were really quite different. In La Mer, for example, um, there isn't this sort of straight ahead, clear cut program to La Mer. He did give subtitles for each one of the movements, for example, from dawn until noon over the sea. Um, so that is sort of like an impression, um, I'm not sure if it actually portrays waves or whether it portrays a surfer or even penguins leaping through the air at uh, different uh, points. So that first example, let me play that first example. Under Deb, you see that very first thing at the top of the page? Let me play that. So, some people call that the play of the waves or any of the other, other things that I mentioned before. Actually, one of the wonderful things about music is it really isn't a language that conveys specific things all the, all the time. If, if you 
heard some, something different being portrayed by that that was just uh, uh, fine. Now, La Mer and La Valse, uh, which is the first Debussy piece that we're, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, the first Ravel piece that we'll hear, they both start fairly much the, uh, the same. They grow out of nothingness and they start building on uh, different things. Um, in La Valse and in Valero, uh, Ravel actually had an idea that he was trying to portray, something very more specific than the vague ideas that um, Debussy had with La Mer. Um, the premieres of La Valse and Valero were both dance premieres. Um, for La Valse, at the head of the score, uh, Ravel actually talked about what he was trying to accomplish at, at the beginning of the piece. He mentioned that you should imagine a ballroom that is darkly lit, that is in the mist. Let me, let me play this a little bit. So there's little snippets of a theme here and there. They're sort of emerging. to say that that really is vague. Uh, it's sort of like a dream, like you're catching little glimpses of dancers here and uh, there. In the score, besides the rehearsal works, he put a big letter A and a big letter B. At letter A, he said, you begin to see the actual outlines of the uh, dancers, and you start to hear more extended introduces several more themes. Finally, at the end of that, he mentions that the dancers dance themselves into a, into a dervish-like frenzy. So let me play a little bit of that, just about 10 seconds worth, of the dancers dancing themselves into a dervish-like frenzy. Snare drum player who 
it starts, plays throughout the entire piece, and it has to be exactly the same tempo throughout the entire piece. Um, that is quite a, uh, a feat, so give her a big hand when she's done, and maybe give her an ice pack. Um, the orchestration in Bolero is really uh, interesting. The instrumentation also, there's some instruments there that we hardly ever hear. The oboe de more, my goodness, the oboe de more, after Bach, that sort of fell out of uh, use. It, 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 it was pretty famous in his cantatas in the St. Matthew Passion. Um, the oboe de more is someplace between an oboe and an English one. So let me point out the oboe de more. say clarinet. Let me play where the clarinet plays that. It's a little darker. It's actually the same pitch, it's the same melody, but it's a little darker. Okay, th that first thing was a sopranino saxophone, which is exceedingly rare. Um, it's, uh, it's only the French Selmers uh, actually sell Sopranino, which is the smallest of the saxophone families. It's even smaller than the soprano sax, which you've probably seen John Coltrane play, or that, uh, what's his name? Kenny G. G or D, or the guy with the hair. So, um, yes, I, I mean, Sopranino sax, he was very tuned into different timbres. He did that on purpose. The soprano sax, the alto sax, could have played exactly the same notes, the timbre would have been different. I keep looking at the, uh, at the clock here because we have a treat today. Also, on the uh, program, we will play a piece by American composer Alan Hovannis. Now, unfortunately, I never met Ravel nor Debussy. Um, I'm not really that old. But we have someone who actually knew Alan Hovannis very well. So instead of me talking about things that I just read here and there, we'll have a guest speaker. Would you like to join us? So Marvin Rosen is a pianist who teaches at the Westminster Conservatory. He has an ASCAP award-winning radio program on WPRB, which is 103.3. Yes. And which, uh, it's Thursday morning when Wednesday morning. Okay. Um, and you've, you've recorded many of his piano pieces. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I originally, well, when I recorded the music back in the early 90s, I actually was in, visited Helvanus uh, in his home in Seattle and played in, on his piano. And it was a wonderful week. In fact, what really sizing about that the fact that when my wife and I were there, they were actually doing with the Seattle Symphony the recording sessions for his Mount St. Helens Symphony. So I had the opportunity to sit at this session right next to the composer when they were going over all this stuff. And it was really truthfully uh, memorable. Exciting. Very exciting. Very exciting. The Mount St. Helens Symphony, if any of you know, ends with this monster uh, uh, towards the end of it, this movement which depicts the volcano and the eruption. It's kind of, it's kind of like uh, an end of a 20th century 1812 overture in terms of the sound that it brings out. It's like, oh, unbelievable. Wow. Unbelievable. And, um, but this actually, with my work with Hovannis, actually began many, many years ago. Before that, I first got introduced to his music back when I was a, 
kid, believe it or not. Back on the days when WNYC had a, man, a program called the Masterwork Hour, some of you may remember. They played a work of his, a concerto number two for violin and string orchestra. And when they were playing this piece, I literally, and I was like a teenager, 15, 16 years old, I remember that I literally stopped what I was doing, and I didn't just listen. I remember actually falling into tears. It was so, music was so beautiful, so spiritual, and it was like nothing I'd ever heard before. And that led me going and analyzing, studying a lot of his other music. I was a pianist, as Gene said, and, and still am. And um, I, I uh, got many, many recordings of his music and got very much inspired by it his music, which eventually led me to doing my doctoral dissertation on his music at Columbia, on, his, on some of his piano sonatas. And what happened was that uh, when I was starting to do my research, I had a kind of a brainstorm. I had gotten his home address, and I said, I'm going to have a little nerve, I guess you could say, and, and write him a letter which I did, and one thing that was, you know, asking him that it would be wonderfully exciting to have the opportunity to meet him and play his music for you, which, which I did, and, and so I wrote the letter. Ten days after I wrote this letter, I got a handwritten letter from him at my home, and I nearly dropped, sure. <laughs> like you wouldn't believe, and through back and forth correspondence, he said he'd love to get together with me, but he was living in Seattle, and I was going to go out to Seattle. So we were corresponding back and forth for a while. And um, it, all of a sudden, uh, I got a, a letter from him. And I remember you talk about Friday the 13th as being an unlucky day. It was on June 13th, which was a Friday, I'll never forget that. I got a letter saying that he and his wife unexpectedly, for business, had to be in New York. Would I care to meet him then? I said, would I care? Would I mind? You know. So, to make a long story short, my, my mom, my mother said, look, all of them are saying now, invite him to our home. He accepted. He came with his wife and his mother-in-law, who was a very talented artist. And we got together at the piano, and it was unbelievable. I was playing his music, we were talking nonstop. I think my mother just about had to put us on a, on a, uh, on a fishing rod leash to get us to the table because she couldn't split us apart. We just went on and on and on. And after we had dinner, and while this was going on, he was telling us stories about things in his life and all sorts of Interest, interesting stuff. After dinner, he gets, he says, well, would you be interested in hearing a new piano sonata? So he takes this manuscript uh, out of his briefcase, and he plays this sonata, and he says, as soon as it gets published, I'll send you a copy. Soon enough, six months later, this piece of music came to my door. But I think one thing to say about a humorous little thing, uh, he would, uh, we, went, I went to, we went to pick him up, he was staying in Wellington, New York, to drive back to Princeton. And there was, he told me I have to check in my briefcase, he had something to check in. He said, you know, in this hotel, they, uh, someone stole my 40th symphony out of my room. You know, they had a briefcase and they were, they were appealed, and he said, to the briefcase, it was a new briefcase. And I said, oh my gosh, what happened? You must have felt horrible when we went, oh, no big deal. I just wrote another one. <laughs> but this was, he was very down to earth, very easy going. And, and uh, so I, when I did my doctoral research uh, and did all that, he was always there to answer questions. I met him often in New, when he was in New York. And I was, like I said, I was in Seattle for the sessions and played and worked on his music with him. And then if that's not all enough, Basically, a real, to make a long story short, he is responsible for me with my wife. I met my wife because of our common interest in his music. And my wife, Beata, is standing, is sitting right there. And we actually, he made suggestions for music of his that would be great to use on our wedding. 
And so it, it basically, you talk about a person who's had so much, I play his music all the time, I hear his music often on the radio. And I mean, we're hearing today The Mysterious Mountain, one of the great works of the 20th century. And I mean, to me, it's a, the first and third movement are very hymn-like hymn and very spiritual in mood. The second movement is one of the most incredible fugues you'll ever hear. And it actually is a double fugue, a fugue with two subjects. The first one is developed in like slow-moving motet renaissance style. And then the second subject is fast with a lot of running uh, scale passages. And then he combines the two at the end. And uh, so, I mean, he was a, one other uh, uh, brief thing before I just conclude is that this is the symphony number two. There are 66 other symphonies in addition to that. And they are works which really deserve to be heard. They're works by one of our real great Americans. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I thought so. That's good. Anyway. And we'll see you in January. We'll be playing Beethoven, Schubert, and Vaughan Williams. Thank you.